But in practice, when companies talk about ebooks, they mean ebooks with digital handcuffs designed to restrict the user and take away the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, one thing that we're free to do with books is buy them anonymously by paying cash. That's the only way I buy books. But most books, for most books, the only place a Swindle user can buy them for the Swindle is from Amazon. And Amazon demands that the users identify themselves, which means that Amazon makes a list of all the books every user has bought. Now that list is so dangerous to freedom and democracy that we cannot tolerate its existence anywhere. Other traditional freedoms of readers include the freedom to give away a book or lend it to a friend or sell it perhaps to a used bookstore. The digital handy handcuffs in the swindle take away those freedoms. No more lending books to your friends, which means among readers, no more friendship. And then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. The swindle takes that away too. We discovered this, it's, it's done with a back door. And we discovered this last year because Amazon used the back door spectacularly, deleting a large number of copies of a particular book, copies that people had bought from Amazon. And the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of its product was 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> If I were writing fiction, I would consider this too unbelievable. I wouldn't dare make this up. But sometimes the truth is more unbelievable than fiction. Oh, I believe they deleted Animal Farm also. <laughs> And the swindle is known to do spying on in other ways. For instance, the notes and underlining that users write gets transmitted to Amazon and published. So it's an extremely malicious product, and there are many others. But I won't claim that all these proprietary programs that deny you freedom won are malicious, have malicious features, because I don't know. There's no way to tell. Without the source code, we can't check what they do. So there are a few of these programs where we know about malicious features, and then there are many others where we just don't know. I presume some of them have malicious features, and others don't. But we can't identify which ones have malicious features and which don't. But Without knowing anything more, I can make a statement about all these programs, and that is their developers are human, so they make mistakes. The code of these programs has bugs, and the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program that lacks Freedom 1, you are a prisoner of the software you use. We, the developers of free software, are human too. So we also make mistakes. The code of our software has bugs. But if you find a bug in the code of our free software, or anything in the code you don't like, you are free to change it. Because we did not make you our prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. So freedom, one, is essential. But it's not enough. Because that is the freedom to personally 
study and change the source code, or within one organization. This is not enough because there are millions of users that don't know how to program. They don't know how to exercise freedom number one directly. But even for programmers like me, freedom one is not enough because we're busy doing other things. And besides, there's so much software in the world. There's so much free software in the world today that no user is capable of personally studying and mastering the source code of all the programs she uses, nor personally writing all the changes that she might wish for. The only way to fully take control of our computing is to do it working together, cooperating, and for that we need freedom three. The freedom to contribute to your community, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. That freedom allows us to work together. Because if there's a program we use and people would like a certain improvement, somebody can write that improvement and then publish his modified version and then we can all use it if we want to. So the result is it's not necessary for each one of us to write the same improvement. It's enough to write it once and then employing Freedom 3 to make this available to everyone. so hot in here that I have to keep drinking but it, so I can cope, but it really would be nice if they could make it a bit colder. Anyway, so Freedom 3 is also essential. And all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedoms 0 and 2 to run the program as you wish, and to redistribute exact copies when you wish, because these don't involve programming. Any user can exercise these two freedoms. Freedoms one and three, the freedom to study and change the source code, and then optionally distribute copies of your modified version, these involve programming. So any given user is more or less able to exercise these freedoms according to how much she knows how to program. And of course, many people don't learn to program. They can't directly exercise these freedoms. But when others who are programmers exercise these freedoms, and when they publish their modified versions, then every user can install those modified versions or not, as he pleases. And thus, all the users get the benefit of living in a society where we all have these four freedoms. And the four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Because every user is free to participate as much as she wishes in society's decision about the future of the program, which is simply the sum total of all the various users' decisions. of what they do with the program. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its developer. The developer has sole power. The developer decides what the program will do and what it won't do. And the program then serves as an instrument of this developer's power, an instrument to subjugate the users. And then the developer can command them, exploit them, and abuse them. So society has a choice to make. On one side, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have the dictatorship of the developer. Society must choose free software and reject proprietary software. The ultimate goal of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace 
and all of its inhabitants. All of you deserve freedom. I hope you will all join me in the free world. I started the free software movement in 1983. During the 1970s, I was part of a free software community. I worked in a lab at MIT where we shared software. And I learned that that was a good way of life. And then the community died under commercial pressure. And it became impossible to use a computer and have freedom. I wanted to change that. I wanted to be able to use computers in freedom. So what could I do? Very few people agreed with me. So I didn't think we would get very far starting an ordinary political movement where we would protest with signs and send letters. And besides, I had no experience doing that kind of thing. I was an operating system developer. Hmm. But being an operating system developer, that suggested another way I could achieve the same result. All I had to do was write another operating system. You see, the reason it was impossible in 1983 to use a computer in freedom was that the computer won't do anything without an operating system. And all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. So if I wrote another operating system, then I, being the author, could legally make it free software, and then everybody would be able to run a computer in freedom using my system. In other words, I would be able to eliminate this injustice of proprietary software, or at least give people a, a place to escape from it to, through technical work in my own field. So I was aware of an injustice that most people did not recognize as an injustice. I had the skills necessary to try to eliminate the injustice, and it looked like nobody was going to do it if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush. <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save that person. <laughs> but perhaps the statement I've made is too strong. Perhaps some executives of BP <laughs> should be Perhaps we, we could identify some about whom I should not make the claim that you have a duty to save them. And whether to include President Obama is not clear. He continues most of the kinds of torture that Bush started uh, and protects the torturers and continues wars of occupation and continues disappearances of people. They're kidnapped and taken to secret prisons, perhaps in Afghanistan, and the US government doesn't even admit that they are prisoners. So, but fortunately, I don't need to resolve these questions because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> but in the case that really occurred, the work to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of software. And that I knew how to do. So I decided to write a free software operating system or die trying. Of old age, that is. Because at the time, the free software movement which I was founding had no active enemies. When I told people about it, a lot of them thought it was silly, but they didn't bother trying to stop the work. They were sure that the job of making a complete free operating system was so big that we would never be able to do it. And I too recognized it was a very big job. 
I didn't know if we would be able to finish a complete free operating system, but at the same time I realized that failure was not an option. We had to develop one. Because without a free operating system, we would never have freedom if we were computer users. So, I decided to develop a complete free operating system. I decided to recruit other people to join in and help to finish it sooner. I decided to follow the design of Unix because Unix was a portable operating system. It could run on various different kinds of computers from different manufacturers. I also wanted to make a system that would be portable and following the design of Unix seemed like the most reliable way to achieve that goal. And then I decided to, to implement the same commands that Unix had. In other words, to make it upward compatible. So that all the people who already knew how to use Unix could switch to my system and they wouldn't have to learn very much. They could just start using it. And then I gave it the name GNU, which is a joke because part of the spirit of that community which died was since we were programming for the fascination of programming. It's true, some of us were employees and the rest were mostly students, but that was all secondary. The fascination of programming was why we were there. And to make it even more fun, we used to give our programs funny names. Because when you imagine the users laughing at the name, that gives you the motivation to finish the program so it will have users to laugh. The name GNU is a joke because it's a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. G-N-U, GNU's Not Unix. And of course, programmers love humor based on recursion. <laughs> But the reason I called it GNU and not ANU or SNU or PNU is that GNU is a word. In fact, it's just about the funniest word in the English language because it's used in lots of jokes. You see, according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced NU. So anytime you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you have a joke. <laughs> Perhaps not a very good joke, <laughs> but there are lots of them. So as soon as you see the word GNU, you're primed to laugh already. Given the opportunity to use this as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our operating system, please do not follow the dictionary. Because if you say the, the new system, you'll get people confused. You see, we've been working on it for 26 years now, and using it for 18 years, it's not new anymore. <laughs> but it still is GNU. So please pronounce it GNU. Avoid the pronunciation the confusing pronunciation, new. And there's another erroneous pronunciation you should avoid, <coughs> which sounds like Linux. <laughs> but how did such a gross error ever get started? What happened was that in 1984, I and others started writing the the hundreds of pieces we would need for the GNU system. And by 1992, we had almost all the system. Some of the pieces we had written, some we had found. But in any case, we had almost a complete free operating system. However, one major essential component was missing. That was the kernel. The kernel of the system is the component that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs that you run. 
We were working on a kernel in 1992, but that project just hasn't really worked well. However, in 92, Mr. Torvalds, who had written a kernel called Linux, released it as free software. Linux existed in 1991, but it was not free software then. Its license was too restrictive. It did not allow commercial distribution, which meant that certain users, namely businesses, could not have Freedom 2 or Freedom 3. And if the license of a program doesn't allow all users to have these freedoms, it's not free software. But in 92, Torvalds made Linux free software by releasing it under the GNU General Public License, which is the most widely used free software license. It's the one that I wrote for use in the programs that we wrote for the GNU system. But I set it up so that anybody else can easily use it too. <clears throat> so when Linux became free software, the combination of the almost complete GNU system and Linux was a complete free operating system. And for the first time it was possible to buy a new PC and run it in freedom. So the liberation of Linux by releasing it under the GNU GPL was an important contribution to the free software community. But the people who put Linux together with all the pieces of the GNU system were focused so much on Linux that they thought of all the rest of the system as a small add-on. And they started calling the whole thing a Linux system and other people imitated them, and that's how it happened that millions of people use this variant of the GNU system, and most of them don't know that it's basically the GNU system. They think it's Linux, and that it was all started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991. That's not fair to us, so please don't call the system Linux. If you use the system, please call it GNU slash Linux, or GNU plus Linux. Give us equal mention. We started it, so we certainly deserve at least that much. Uh, so, if you use the system, please call yourself a GNU slash Linux user. And uh, when you're talking about the various versions of the system that are available to install, please call them GNU slash Linux distributions. And when you're talking about a a computer that's running this system, please call it a GNU slash Linux box, <clears throat> etc. But it's true that credit is not the most important ethical issue in life. And if it were just about credit, it would not be worth so much attention. But there's something much more important at stake in your choice of the name to call the system. And that is your freedom. Your freedom is at stake. Indirectly, of course. Because directly, the choice of names doesn't change anything. But indirectly, it influences people. If you call a rose an onion, it will still smell as sweet, but cooks will get confused. The words you choose determine the message you communicate to other people. And that message exercises influence over other people's thoughts, which then determine their actions. So, over time, you do influence others through your choice of words. Since 26 years ago, the name GNU has been associated with the ideas of freedom that I've told you today. The name Linux is associated with different ideas. With the ideas of Mr. Torvalds, and what are they? He doesn't value freedom. He doesn't think that software users deserve freedom. He doesn't even think he deserves freedom. He doesn't value it. 
He, is, he says that he's happy to use proprietary software as long as it's convenient. So what he's saying is value convenience, not freedom. He has a right to his views. But it's not right that the tremendous job that we did for the sake of freedom be misattributed to him and then serve as his platform to oppose the views that motivated us to do the work. And it's dangerous for all of us because when people think that he started the whole thing, they tend to admire him so much that they copy his views. They adopt his views, which means they don't value their own freedom. They don't learn to value freedom. And that means that when we have to fight to defend our freedom, they won't be with us. And because of that, we could lose. <clears throat> our future depends above all on what we value. If we want to have freedom, we have to value freedom and we have to act based on that value. Freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you have to defend it. You can see that through all of history, up through the way Bush damaged human rights all around the world. Now, in order to defend freedom, you have to value freedom. And in order to value freedom, you have to understand the concept. In most areas of life, which are not new, after all, most areas of life have been around for quite some time, and the debate about human rights in most areas of life has gone on for decades or centuries. Plenty of time to reach conclusions about what human rights people deserve and spread those conclusions around the world. Now that doesn't assure we always succeed in defending human rights. In the past 10 years, we have lost a lot of battles. But at least it gives us a base to try. However, computing is a fairly new area of life. It's not even 20 years that most people in a few advanced countries have been using computers. And in other countries, it's even less time since most people began using computers. That's not much time to have a debate about what human rights you deserve in using a program. It's not much time, even if there had been a debate. But for the most part, there has been no debate. Almost everyone started using computers with proprietary software, surrounded by other users of proprietary software. Proprietary software was the only possibility they knew of. So they took for granted that software can be proprietary, that proprietary software is normal and legitimate and acceptable, which means that, in effect, they allowed the proprietary developers to dictate the answer to the question, what human rights do you deserve in using a program? And they dictated the answer, just about none at all, which is the answer that was most convenient for them, most profitable for them. And people mostly accepted this, except for us in the free software movement. We reject that position, we are trying to start a debate about the subject because we believe we have identified Fox for human rights that you deserve in using a program, namely the four freedoms that define free software. But when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public and even to the attention of the users 